Welcome to the Divorce TV Show live stream. And today's guest is Sue Lee. Sue Lee is a hypnotherapist, so we're going to be talking about uh, not standing on the stage pretending to be a chicken, but quite the opposite about how powerful a tool hypnotherapy is for healing and how relevant it is for people who are dealing with the stress and trauma of divorce. <laughs> and welcome Sue. Good to see you. And I'm uh we are going to be talking I, I I'm sorry about the mention about the chickens, but I thought we just gotta get that out of the way. Yeah, yeah. It's, but there's certain very clever professionals who've ruined hypnotherapy as a as a way of a healing technique, isn't it? Because it has made people think of it as this bizarre thing that you do and, and you people get drunk and embarrass themselves but that is so not what you do perhaps you can clear up those misapprehensions definitely, right now definitely no it's definitely not what i do um stage hypnosis and hypnotherapy are two very different things you know um with stage hypnotherapy people are there to be entertained when people come to me as a hypnotherapist they're coming to me because they've got a particular issue that they would like to um to sort out really and what are the most common reasons why that people use hypnotherapy for? Oh my word! There's, I think probably some of the most common things are things like phobias, and fears, um, anxiety, um, you know, weight loss, giving up smoking. I mean, there's there's a whole array of things that um, hypnotherapy is, you know, really really great, a great you know therapeutic tool. Um, and and this is something that you've uh, have you noticed a difference in the kind of things that people come to you for in recent years, or has it always been pretty pretty consistent? I think now, and dare I say, you know, in the last few years, anxiety um, is a massive one. A lot of people are feeling a lot of anxiety at the moment, and you know they think they, they they go to the doctors and a lot of the time when they go to the doctors they'll end up being prescribed pills of some description or whatever so when they come to me they're looking for an alternative route really to to help them through that through that anxious period in their life so am i right in thinking they're not just looking to make things feel better but they are actually looking to resolve the the root causes of their yes. anxiety absolutely i think you know when when somebody comes to see me that's exactly what they're coming to see me for they want to get better from from the inside and yeah. you know from from up here because obviously with anxiety you know it is a natural thing we all feel anxious we all feel anxious at some stage in our lives and it's explaining to people that you know anxiety if you have anxiety um, or you're feeling anxious you're not broken it's just the body's natural way of dealing with things it's trying to keep you safe it's just a bit of a faulty program that's running and i have to ask this when you said uh, that, that hypnotherapy is great for dealing with people with phobias what phobia, phobias have you had to help people resolve? Well, the most recent one was a flying phobia, a fear of flying. And he, you know, he's been on uh, aeroplanes throughout his life. But I think, and I, I really understand how, um, how he felt because this particular chap, he got this fear of flying once he had his children. And that's, oh. it's, it's really strange because that's exactly how I was. I was fine up until I had my children. And then, of course, I went to get on a plane with the children. And then I was thinking, oh, my God, you know, I'm putting my children in danger. I'm, you know, if the plane crashes, I'm going to kill my children. So it wasn't until I became a hypnotherapist that I actually sorted it all out. And now, of course, I don't have a problem with flying and nor do my children. They love it. So, yeah, and, that's um, probably the latest one. And when people live for often years and years with these these phobias, I knew someone once who had a phobia about you know, thunder, thunder and lightning, uh, which yeah. I would personally have thought was quite debilitating. Debilitating. She couldn't go out in a storm at mm. all and would cower away. Um, 
when with something like that, and I, I realise that everybody's different, but is there a, a general rule for how long it takes to resolve these if, things? If I, could, if I can just tell you that actually we are only born with two fears, if you like, and that is, uh, first of all, um, a fear of falling and a fear of sudden loud noises. They are inherent in us, okay? They're, they're innate, they're, they're, they're there and they've been there since caveman days and, and we have to have those because they're, they're the two things that keep us safe. If you go back to caveman days, he needed to know, you know, when he came out of his cave, if he was being chased by, um, by a bear or, or a tiger, he needed to know, he needed to have that uh, fear of loud noises or, or a fear of falling. He needed to have that. So that's the only two fears that we, that we have. Everything else is learnt behaviour. It all comes from maybe a, a, a particular time, you know, I don't know, mum, when you're a child, sees a spider run across the floor and sees the mum, or hears, and sees the mum scream and then all of a sudden the child thinks, scary spider, ah, oh, when I see a spider I'm going to scream and of course every time that they see a spider it embeds it a little bit deeper and it gets scarier so this little tiny snowball starts off like this ends up like this so by the time they're adults so yeah so how long does it take on average to fix a phobia like that well lots of people come to me for uh, for phobias and they're t um it tends to be you can often sort out a phobia in in one session one to two sessions it just depends on what it is and if there are other things surrounding it and you often find as well if somebody's got a fear of one thing they have a fear of something else as well it doesn't tend to just be one thing it's there are often other fears or phobias and and actually the the, the difference between a fear and a phobia uh, a phobia is something that actually stops you from doing what you really want to do a phobia is is um, far worse than a fear in that respect because it's actually really interfering with your life and when it's stopping you from moving forward and, and enjoying your life then that I think is when you really need to see somebody like myself to to actually sort it out. And what do you think the block is because it seems uh, incredible to me that people live with these phobias and these fears for often years and and don't do anything about it um, what do you think are the blocks for people to come and see a hypnotherapist? Well, I, I think that a lot of people are very worried about seeing a hypnotherapist because because of the negative, um, uh, what they see, the negativity around stage hypnosis. So they often think that I've, you know, I can have control of their mind, which of course isn't true because if it was, I would have been able to control my children and get them to tidy their rooms when they were younger. <laughs> <laughs> so you know I can't read people's minds I can't control anybody I can't make anybody do anything that they don't want you know make anybody do anything they don't want to do um, so I think with people coming to see a hypnotherapist it's often the last resort hmm. and and what other um, you mentioned yourself that you managed to sort your own phobia out how did you come to get into hypnotherapy and and saying what what led you to think oh I think I'll be I think I'll become a hypnotherapist. Well, I've I've always been um, a people person. I love people um, and I love helping people. Many years ago, I was actually a reflexologist. I gave that up when my children were very small. Um, because obviously I had small children, it was like very difficult to keep a business running um, with small children. So. Once they got to a certain age where they didn't really need me as much, it was like, right, time to do something else. And it was a friend of mine in Australia said to me, why don't you try hypnotherapy? You'd be really good at it. And I was like, oh, actually, yeah, that sounds quite nice. That's quite, that sounds like quite a good idea. And of course, that was it. I went off. To begin with, I did just a, a weekend introductory class. Absolutely loved it. Came home, bouncing off the walls and the ceiling just with so much enthusiasm that I thought this is the career for me this is what I want to do because I could see the profound effect it was having on people just being in this room with you know 20 or 30 other people and the things that people were fixing there and then in a matter of minutes so 
that's what what really led me to it and then of course I went off and and um, and I did uh, uh, it took me over a year in fact it took me nearly two years to qualify because the program that I did um, that the school that I that I went with um, they did it on a, a, a year's rolling um, uh, rolling course so if you missed one and I, unfortunately through illness I had to miss two it, it went on till the next year so it actually took me two years to actually uh, to actually qualify to uh, to become and a lot of case studies I think it was the right thing for me because of course it gave me a lot more time to do a lot more case studies and work with sort of friends and family before sort of you know going off and um, becoming qualified and and that whole uh, b building this uh, healing art as as a as a business um, mm. it's so important isn't it to be very clear not just about what things you can help people with but what life situations they'll be in when they come to talk to you so obviously I'm alluding here to people dealing with divorce or the stress of co-parenting with a very difficult often may have a difficult relationship with their ex um, mm. very challenging times bereavement of course is another one there's times yeah. in people's lives where everything just becomes um, insurmountable and perhaps that's often the time when they're, they're brave enough to try something new yeah. So how do how do people come to you normally? How do they find you? Um, what do you, do you work? I believe online mostly because a lot I, of people would assume you'd be in a room with them somewhere. Yeah, and and I did work um, face to face most of the time. I did. I've always worked. Well, I say I've always worked, but in you know in the latter in the last few years I've worked online because the pandemic taught us so much when when we couldn't actually come face to face with clients because I used to work face more face to face and a little bit online um, and then of course the pandemic happened and we're all working online and then we realized actually this is a great way to work I can see more people you know clients are actually far more relaxed because they're they're in their own homes they haven't had the stress of traveling to me and they can they can come to me from the comfort of their own home so yeah it's um it's much better way of working for most people and and some people might be thinking well how can you do hypnotherapy through a zoom and they're probably imagining that you've got this little coin or crystal that you're moving backwards and forwards so can you can you just explain how 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 it actually works well it's it's really we don't use that of course anymore that was you know <laughs> when the hypnotherapy came about many 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 years ago um, these days it's all to do with like language patterns and the way that you're actually talking to somebody and you know hypnosis has been around since man was able to speak but hypnotherapy has obviously come on in latter years and it's really about how you talk to somebody and um, that's where NLP and EFT come in you know it's mm. like hypnotherapy and NLP are they're like a pair of gloves so they go together and that's how that's how we work we work purely um, when, when on talking to people and finding out more about them more about what's going on in in their head um, so no, you don't have to be in front of you don't have to be face to face in the same room as me and I don't use a, a watch or anything else. <laughs> and for those who don't perhaps don't know what NLP is, um, how is there a simple way of describing what's happening to uh, to someone when they say yes? I you know obviously they have to uh, participate, they have to agree that they want this process. Like you say, you're not controlling anyone in any way. No. Is there sort of a dummy's guide to explain what's happening to them um, in, sitting in their living room on Zoom? Yeah, I mean, um, hypnosis is really, um, it's just a, t it's a technique that I use along with NLP. That's, it's, it's just a way of talking to people in a certain way to induce trance. Um, and there are different levels of trance and you would use different levels of trance for different issues. So trance and hypnosis mean the same thing. And what happens um, 
when you put when you induce trance uh, somebody into a trance you are bypassing what they call the critical faculty and you start to directly talk to their unconscious mind so if you can, if i if i can explain it mm. that the brain is a little bit like an, an iceberg so you have 10 percent where you'll see the tip of the iceberg which is your conscious brain and then 90 percent that's the 10 percent of the brain and then 90 percent underneath is the iceberg of the iceberg is where it's hidden and underneath the water okay and that's your unconscious mind and that is where all your beliefs and all your values are held that is where if you can imagine when you when you're running down the stairs you don't have to think about which step your foot is falling on so it's the co subconscious that's driving the conscious mind so when we induce trance we can talk to the subconscious mind and that is where all change is possible yeah. so is someone still sit sitting there answering questions but they are are they doing it verbally or through their yeah. phys physically what what does it feel like to be in in a, a state of trance that allows you to act, them help them access their un unconscious i try to explain it to people it's a, it's a little bit like being um, in a daydream. So, you know, if you've ever just sort of sat there looking out the window day daydreaming, you're in, a, you're in a light trance. If you're reading a book and you're engrossed in the book or watching a film, you're in a, 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 you're in a hypnotic trance. So everybody experiences trance every day throughout the day. Even when you're driving, if anybody's a driver and they've ever driven from A to B, and you don't always recall and you sort of get to the other end and you think oh crikey did i god i don't remember the lights i don't remember going through the lights i've got have i just gone through a red light and no you haven't you're just in what they call um uh, highway hypnosis mm -hmm. yeah so no it's um that's sorry i forgot more you <laughs> well no you, you were just describing quite you know eloquently what it is to be in a trance and that and that it's actually something that happens to people yeah. so, all the time so, yeah, yeah. And um, so you're putting them into that uh, almost like a, shall we say, a daydream state, um, but presumably yeah. a little bit deeper. And and they are, um, and you are, and your skill in many ways is knowing what the questions are that you need to yeah. ask them. It's, it's, it's all it is. It's a focused state of awareness, and it's very relaxing. Mm. So people don't need to be frightened or worried about coming to see a hypnotherapist um you know as i say i haven't got i haven't got a magic wand i'm not harry potter i can't make you do anything that you don't want to do i'm not gonna you know i can't take control of you um but it's just a, a way of actually accessing the subconscious mind and resolving issues at a, sub, at a subconscious level and I, i've had hypno hypnosis of just a few times and I remember just this intense relaxation it was so it was like yeah it was a lovely feeling um yeah. at the end of it and last you and and I never felt I felt at any point I could go no I don't want to do this or whatever I felt completely in control just incredibly mm -hmm. relaxed it was lovely um so with with that being the case um and you're able to really tap into deeper stuff you it you intimated this earlier that someone might come for let's say they're scared of spiders or flying but there might be more complex things have happened to them in their life um mm. that they've got submerged in their subconscious that's causing trouble um is there ever a a, a fear do you think that people have that you're going to open up some pandora's box of trauma and stress no, I I think, you know, as a hypnotherapist, we're very aware that somebody could have an ab reaction if you um, if you ask the wrong question or if they're not ready, if they're not ready to divulge, they won't divulge it. They won't go because their subconscious is there for their protection. So I'm not going to, you know, listen, if that was the case, I, you know, there'd be dodgy hypnotherapist may be going around getting people's bank account details etc yeah. <laughs> so, no, you're not, not going to do that that's not going to happen so so it is a very actually a very safe uh way to do to to get some de-stressing done some healing and so in what areas of, sort of divorce and co-parenting do you think would be particularly relevant the 
to come I, along and, and get and try this out basically hmm. well i think with divorce it's a very stressful situation even the most amicable divorces are, at some stage are going to be stressful so hypnotherapy can deal with uh, help deal with that side of the stress um it's a lot of the time people suffer with maybe um um, self uh, image self image so it helps with um, positive self image so it depends on the situation you know if people are suffering from low self esteem or lack of confidence you can you know we we can help with that I deal with a lot of people with uh, lack of self confidence and self esteem is issues as well as anxiety and stress and all those sorts of things so hypnotherapy is such a fantastic um, way to, to deal with that sort of thing and giving people giving people tools that they can actually take away and use for the rest of their life you know it's not something that's going to wear off they can use these things for the rest of their life so you know apart from things like that it's it can give you coping strategies um, it deals with emotional healing there's uh, there's so many things clarity with moving forward with your life so there's a lot of ways that hypnotherapy can actually help in the in the process of divorce so whether it's um someone who is uh, maybe they there's been infidelity so they're absolutely crushed i mean that's a big one for for self-esteem um yeah, or absolutely. or maybe it's a teenager who's just gone on off to university and that's the point where parents decide oh they fled the nest so we can get divorced now and their their world's come tumbling in because they're already trying to deal with this whole new situation yeah. so things around self-esteem confidence um just being able to cope really with with everyday life Absolutely. have you got any um examples of of how people you may have worked with and how and have made what the difference was to them you know kind of how, what does it look like after they've spent some time oh, working with huge, you huge huge i mean i had i did have one client that actually they weren't she wasn't married but she lived with um, a chap they had two children and he was a very abusive partner and basically one day she walked through the door and he put a picture frame over her head mm -hmm. and she was terrified of him he used to make her get in the car and he would drive erratically mm -hmm. and dangerously and say he was going to kill them and she was terrified of him she did a program of hypnosis, uh, hypnotherapy, sorry, with me, and by the end of it, she actually had the courage to actually leave him. Oh and wow! She left him with the children, and she went on to have a, a really great life. She she so, left him and took the children. You mean? Oh yes. Oh, <laughs> she yes. didn't. She, didn't she leave wasn't them with the them children <laughs> there. No, absolutely not. So you know that that's. Um, that was a very big thing for her because of course he was very controlling and she was terrified of him like a lot of women are and, and men actually you know you oh, think yes it, you think it's just a, 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 a that females are frightened of the men but there are a lot of men that are frightened of their wives and you know people people can't a lot of people can't believe that but it's it's true you know a lot of there's a lot of um, narcissistic behavior out there and there again hypnotherapy can help with dealing with a, a narcissistic partner so there's there's a lot of yeah it would be a very uh, powerful adjunct to uh, learning you can learn the communication skills you can learn lots of practical things yeah. of ways to deal with it but how do you stop that voice going round and round in your head? So I can see that the hypnotherapy would be very powerful with that. Um, and that uh, you know, sounds like quite an extreme example, but as you say, frighteningly common. Um, what do you think uh, are the other areas that people who are dealing with the, the stress of divorce uh, that could help with? I mean, things like... Um, self-esteem we've already talked about especially if you want to go out dating again what, yeah absolutely. what about um what about things like uh your ability to you know, sleep properly yes um insomnia is is huge you know it's a huge problem for people and a lot of the time the insomnia comes from actually the stress side of things you know if people are 
running over things in their head the whole time you know you get into bed and all of a sudden it starts up doesn't it you know because you've got time to and time to to think about things you start to try and wind down and all of a sudden these impulsive thoughts come into your head well of course you know i would be able to give them coping strategies for that and also hypnosis for insomnia you know it's it's a learned that's that's another thing where it's a learned sort of behavior you sort mm. of like get into bed and and it's sort of almost self-perpetuating because when you can't sleep you get into bed and you the first thing you sort of say oh god am i going to sleep i bet i'm not going to be able to sleep tonight and of course when you start with that narrative in your head that's exactly what's going to happen if you keep saying just telling yourself you can't sleep what's going to happen you're mm. not going to be able to sleep i i, I i'm just thinking <laughs> thinking i might have to book in with a session on that one it's <laughs> uh, uh, four o'clock in the morning it's like no this is just isn't happening <laughs> so, um, so but with uh is this is something that has to be done one to one obviously that's the I ideal but are you able to to work with small groups as well when it's a, a common uh, uh, something to do with stress or insomnia or the, or yeah. does it does it not work because the reasons behind each person will be so different Yes, you can do you can do group sessions. It depends on what it's for. Like I used to um, have a group for menopausal women, and I gave them like an ultimate change challenge. So you know, all those women were experiencing a lot of things to do with the menopause, which, believe it or not, you know, they're now realising it's not just about hot flushes, etc. Yeah. There are things like anxiety and depression and all those sort of things all of a sudden you know lack of confidence and people you know women once they go into the menopause all of a sudden this comes out of nowhere and they just don't understand what's going on with their bodies so yes i've worked with um, a group of um, women that were all menopausal um, yes you can work with groups but of course it just depends on what the issue is so, yeah so yeah up to it yeah, we to set expectations so there are certain things you could do with the group to give people the sense of what it is but ultimately once they're clear that actually I don't I guess it's that decision isn't it I don't want this anymore and mm. then they come to you which you know I believe with smoking people have to I spoke to a hypnotherapist many years ago and he said I won't do people who smoke unless they give me a good reason why they want to stop because if they're not really committed it's it's just not going to really work for them yeah i mean i've i just recently i've got i've worked with somebody who smoked for nearly 30 years and my first question to him was how much do you want to give up smoking and he said what do you mean i really really want to give it up and i said okay on a scale of one to ten one you don't ten more than anything in the world you want to give up smoking and he said oh about a six or a seven and I said, you don't really want to give it up, do you? And he went, yes, yes, I do. And I went, mm, why didn't you say 10 then? And he went, oh, I don't know. And I said, come back and talk to me when you're, a, when you're nearer a 10. And I think that you may be ready to, to give it up. And um, I'd met this, this particular chap at, um, in, at the NEC. I was doing something at the NEC. And he then came up to me later on that day. And he went, oh, well, I've got, I'm up to about an eight, nearly a nine. <laughs> <laughs> That's, was that enough for you? Would you? Did you allow him to work with you? <laughs> I, 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 I sort of had another chat to him and then he came up to me the following day and he said, I'm at a 10, I'm ready to do this. And of course, you know, Never. after talking to him and sort of finding out what his drivers were, what was it that was driving him to want to, to give up smoking? Because the want to give up smoking has to be bigger than the want for another cigarette. Hmm. And a lot of people have, have, have come to me in the past and said, oh, I really want to give it up. And I go, why do you want to give it up? And they go, oh, my wife said I've got to give it up. Or the doctor says I'm going to get hardening of the arteries or whatever. Uh, that's not good enough because that's not your primary reason. That's somebody else's reason for sending you to a hypnotherapist or, or whatever. So mm. it has to be what you want. And the driver for it has to be there. And I think that's true of all or healing modalities is they're not you don't come at them for as a victim you come as a a, a a way to be empowered to effectively i guess in some ways to, to be participate in your own healing because it's that working together that works so well and 
And that brings me to you. You mentioned a few times that you give people the tools so they don't just have a session with you. They go away with mm. tools. What, what can you give me some examples? Well, one of the things that most people actually don't realize with anxiety and with stress what happens is when you become anxious or you become stressed what happens is the body fires up cortisol the stress hormone and as soon as that does that it's like a chain reaction and it fires up your adrenaline and of course what happens is once you go into you're coming from the, what they call the sympathetic nervous system and all of a sudden when you're when you're uh, coming from that the, from that system and the adrenaline's going and the cortisol's fired up what happens is all your other um, systems in your body start to shut down, shut down, and they do that because obviously you need adrenaline to uh, for your muscles and to, to be it sends because everybody knows that when you have, start to have anxiety, you start to sorry you start to um, have a rapid heartbeat, you know your breathing becomes shallower, and uh, and what happens is your body needs. Your, uh, to shut down all the other systems so that it can pump blood and oxygen to your muscles and all the rest of it for you to take fight so it's, it brings in that fight, flight or freeze and you need that you need that to actually do whatever it is but of course what happens is it's often a, a, a 40 like, like a 40 car alarm that's gone off because a juggernaut has just gone past and one of the ways one of the most simplest ways to actually um, squash that immediately is to actually do some deep breathing because when you start to deep breathe and you and it's and we're talking thoracic breathing like deep belly breaths you start to get oxygen to your brain and then you can think properly and then everything starts to calm down so it brings in the noradrenaline it brings in that 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 um, antidote to the adrenaline and you can't feel stressed and feel calm at the same time it's impossible so one of the easiest ways to do that is to learn how to breathe properly and of course when I can I teach people how to breathe properly and once you do that you've got that tool for the rest of your life and if you actually make it a part of your whole routine like I do it first thing in the morning when I wake up I do four rounds of the four, seven, eight breath. So I breathe in for four, hold for seven, and breathe out for eight. And I do that four times. I do it before I go to sleep. And I'll often do it a couple of times during the day. And that actually helps so much with keeping you calm because it's accumulative. Mm. So the more you do it, the quicker that you can actually when you do get stressed and it fires up the cortisol and the adrenaline the quicker you can bring in that noradrenaline and bring it down and come back to homeostasis and come back to to be in balance more in balance cool so and um, it's and uh, um, what what um in your sort of own life and your own uh, story do you, have you found it you said you said it helped you be able to fly um oh. Has it been beneficial to you either just as a healer who's using this modality to help others or in your own life as um, someone who's used it themselves? Has, has it had any impact on your life? If, you know, oh, huge, huge impact. I had the biggest, apart from that I had this fear of flying, um, and it's funny because I've got a friend who is a pilot and and she lives in Malta and every time I go over there she'd go how was flight and I go oh it was this that and the other and she'd roll her eyes at me and say to me you know oh the plane can do this before it's going to fall out of the sky or whatever <laughs> and even though you know I knew that because she'd always told me that I was still terrified so yes obviously I got rid of my own fear of flying but also I had the most terrible fear of public speaking now Anyone that knows me knows I can talk the hind leg off a donkey. But when it comes to public speaking, I was like, no, that's not happening. And I actually went to see a hypnotherapist myself probably about, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've been qualified for 10 years, but probably about 17 years ago when my brother asked me to stand up in the church and read 
do a reading for him at his wedding. And I said, absolutely not. No, that's not happening. And he was like, why? And I was like, no. Um, I'll get up there. I won't be able to say the words. It, no, I'm just not doing it. And he said, yes, you are. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't get out of this. And I went to see a hypnotherapist, and I did the reading at his, at his wedding. So it, it cured me of my mm. fear of public speaking, really. And that is such a massive fear for so so many people. I mean, and I can imagine, although you know, obviously as part of a best way to divorce, we keep people out of court as um, as much as the other person, as the person's spouse will allow, because uh, everyone has to be. My my view is crazy to go to court um, when there are so many better alternatives. But if you are dragged in because maybe your spouse is trying to use the legal system uh, to bully you, I think, again, that is a place where people can be very fr feel very frightened. And even also mediation. I have to reassure people you can be in a breakout room on Zoom. You can have your, you know, your uh, healer or your coach with you or your therapist. You don't have to, if you don't want to see them, you don't have to. So, but there is that fear of having to negotiate with someone um, and be accused of things and there was often I think you know I would say irrationally because it, it is irrational to expect someone who's going to be in the middle of this a trained mediator to take sides but they go, oh I think the mediator will take sides and they, have, they put all of these fears in, into this and all these excuses but really they're just scared of that situation do you think the hypnotherapy could be a fantastic tool for people oh, in that situation yeah, absolutely. Yeah, because it gives people that confidence. You know, uh, we, we, we didn't come out of the womb feeling, you know, unconfident. It's, you know, when you look at children and the way mm. children behave, up until the age of about sort of five, children, they, you know, they, they run and jump about and they roll around on the floor and they've got no inhibitions whatsoever. They don't care what anybody else is thinking. You know, but as we get older, we start taking on board all these, all these things that's you know that are right or wrong or you know that's not acceptable. We don't act like that, and this, that, and the other. And of course, it's the things that happen to us in our life that shape the way we are. So, with hypnotherapy, you know, and a lot of the time we're telling ourselves things that actually aren't true at all. We have this script in our head and there's a, a fabulous guy on facebook called richard wilkins the whiz and he talks about the script and i would tell anybody to go and listen to him because it is the script in our head and the script in our head tells us a lot of lies and if you listen to that script you know how many times do we look in the mirror i've looked in the mirror and gone oh god like you know dodging the call for today or you know whatever and if you keep telling yourself that well what's that going to do to your self-esteem what's that going to do to your confidence you know you have to start talking to yourself like you're talking to your best friend to start treating yourself mm. with love and kindness and don't believe the lies that that the script is telling you or maybe a narcissistic partner or somebody that's been you know chipping away telling you you're not good enough or you're this or you're that or you're the other you know you the more you tell somebody that the more likely they are to believe you so uh, to you, the more likely you are to believe it so i'm um, you know i'm a firm believer mm. in that. putting yourself at the top of the metaphorical pile well, I'm, I'm going to really encourage all of the members of the Secret Divorce Group to particularly to listen to that part, because <laughs> there's quite a few who I think should have a word with you. Um, it's because it's not when you've had that constant belittlement, that is, uh, it's not just affecting your self-esteem. For some people, it's almost becomes like a, a trauma. But I would I would say close to PTSD in extreme cases. Yeah. And it is not something you can just pull yourself together. It, you can't sort it on your own. No, you no. need tools to do it and basically um, what I'm getting from you here is that the hypnotherapy gives them the tools absolutely I, you know I think that's why I love doing it that's why I've, I've done this for the last 10 years because I've had so much feedback from people and you know testimonials and reviews 
And when somebody says to you, you know, you've changed my life, or, you know, I've had somebody's parent come up to me and say, you know, like, I can't thank you enough. You've saved my son's life. You know, when somebody says that to you, it's, it's, there's no better feeling than the fact that, you know, I, I don't do things to people. They do it themselves. I'm just the, I'm just a facilitator. I'm not, I'm not the one that actually, you know, I haven't got, a, as I said earlier, well, as I've said to many people before, I have, I'm not Harry Potter. I haven't got a magic wand. But, you know, it's really coming to see somebody like me that can help you move forward and move forward with your life. Beautiful. And, and I have to ask you, if you, you must have had some very interesting cases. Are there any that you wouldn't be too indelicate to, to mention? Bearing in mind this goes out on so many different platforms. Well, if, it, if I ever talk about anybody... A, a, you know that's come to see me first of all I have their permission because obviously what anybody ever says to me is confidential yeah. if I do ever talk about it it's because somebody has given me the permission to talk about it and you'll find that they have given me a, a testimonial online that um you know has got their name on it because on Facebook yes. you can't you, you know somebody's given you that or on Google you can see um you can see quite clearly who they are so they've always given me permission to actually um to actually do that i mean there was one guy in particular well there's actually two if i think about first of all there's one that actually lost his daughter his daughter to cancer very very sad she was very young she was only seven years old and he was obviously him and his family were heartbroken but he spent probably three years of his life looking after everybody else's needs making sure his wife was okay making sure his son was okay and didn't really think of himself in all of that and three years down the line he sort of came to me and he was at rock bottom you know and he he really didn't know how to deal with that and that's where you know I, I helped him get his life back and that's actually the, the, the gentleman whose mum said to me, we were out once, and she said to me, are, are you Sue Lee? And I said, yes, she went, I can't thank you enough. You gave my son his life back. You know, so when somebody says something like that to you, it's, it's so humbling and so gratifying that it's just, it's lovely. It's, and that's what makes me want to do this job. You know, I love it. And, and the other thing is, that talking about other people one of um one, another one that springs to mind is a, a chap that actually had the worst pain his pain he had a pain in his leg and he'd had it for i don't know up to a couple of years i think it was and he'd had an accident where he'd actually got the bottom of his leg smashed up and he didn't have a broken leg or anything like that it was all soft tissue damage and he'd obviously was under the the hospital the hospital said look there's nothing wrong he's had every scan and x-ray everything and they said sorry there's nothing we can do go go home you can go to pain management clinic or you can take some painkillers but there's nothing else we can do and he put up with that for a couple of years and he came to me through a friend of a friend and it was online literally within one session and it literally was done in about 20 25 minutes took the pain away and it went from an eight to a nine, which was constant every night, even though he was taking painkillers, to nothing. Wow. To nothing. And like, you know, he was just, I said to him, so where are you with the pain now? And he got up and walked around the room and he said, what pain? I haven't got one. And if I'm honest, even I sort of went, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, okay. But, he, like, but his brain was telling him before that, that there was pain, even though in theory, was there a mis miscommunication going on there? And, and then... well, that's 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 exactly that's exactly it. You know, I think that it's like there again. It's like that forty car alarm that's that's gone off, and it is that sort of miscommunication. Now, don't get me wrong. First of all, I must say that as a hypnotherapist, you don't just take somebody's pain away. You have to know more about that. You know, we don't because pain is there for a reason on the basis that, you know, if you fell over and broke your leg and, you know, if somebody comes to me and says, oh, like, you know, like 
I need this pain taken away. I'm like, well, no, you actually need to go to the hospital, <laughs> get it put in a cast. You wouldn't, or, or somebody stuck their hand in a gas ring um, and, and burnt their hand. You know, you need that pain to tell you to take your hand out of the gas ring. So you have to find out more about it. And the general rule of thumb is that the fact is that they've had that pain, um, they've been to the doctors or the hospital and they've exhausted every other avenue and been told that there's nothing else that there's nothing else that we can do you know and i think when once you get to that stage you know that actually if you're taking painkillers painkillers are going to turn the pain off mm. so if you're doing that and there's no other reason for you to have the pain because let's be honest pain is a way of alerting you that something is wrong you know somebody's got an arthritic pain or a, a pain i had another chap actually who he was pushing a boat up a up a um a slipway and he fell on his knee and he had a partial knee replacement and he was left with this pain in his knee um and he came to me i got rid of it literally got rid of it and he just said oh my god i've put up with that for so long it's just gone i can't believe it's just gone but of course you know there was no need for him to be hanging on to that pain yeah he'd had the new he'd had the new knee he didn't need that pain anymore so mm. you, you have to be careful. You can't just go around taking people's pain away for no reason. You have to know more about it. And often with people with arthritis, you know, they don't need to be told every day. You know, if you've got, a, if you've got an arth arthritic pain in your hand, it can be turned off. Most of the time it can be turned off. Why? Because you don't need, it's a bit like me ringing you up and saying, Susie, do you know you've got a pain in your hand? And you go, <laughs> yeah. And then you put the phone down and then the next day I ring up and go, do you know you've got a pain in your hand? Oh, yeah. And then the next day you find it. You don't need to be told that every day mm. so there's no reason for you to have that pain and that's the sort of thing that you can if not turn it off you can lower the pain to a far more acceptable level wow and, and there's so many people with um arthritic rheuma, rheum, rheumatic all kinds of um issues with the uh, uh, where the body is effectively attacking itself in many ways which are seem to be often linked with stress and not dealing with that stress properly so i hadn't really thought about uh, someone with with uh, arthritis being able well, to do anything about it fibromyalgia is a massive one these days there's a lot of people with fibromyalgia mm. and you know hypnotherapy can help where that's concerned as well there's you know the possibilities are endless really and it's just um only talking to people and finding out what's actually going on in their lives mm. that's where you know the, well that's where the life coaching and everything else comes in as well and and you, you mentioned life coaching so what what you you've you've studied nlp obviously um you did two years with the hypnotherapy and you've been doing that for for what, 10 years now are there any yeah. are there any other skill sets that you've picked up along the way well i'm an eft practitioner and for people that don't know what eft is it stands for emotional freedom technique and that is basically um, a bit like uh, acupuncture without the needles and you're working on sort of Chinese meridians and energy points and you basically you might have actually seen on I'm a celebrity boy George was doing it I think it was last year where he, he was tapping on certain parts of his body and repeating certain phrases and there again you know that that came about because somebody actually um, in invented that for want of a better word be for ptsd it was oh, it was interesting yeah because um there was a lot of these uh, chaps it was in america i think i'm trying to remember the, I think his name's gary craig um and he did uh, he actually um invented eft for people with ptsd that were in the vietnam war and there was you know a lot of people suffered really bad ptsd and I'm sure you can probably look on YouTube and there's probably stuff on YouTube that will show you. Um, so, you know, EFT is fabulous. It's one of these things that I can, another tool I can, I can show people and they can teach their children, they can do it on themselves. It's very good there again. You know, EFT can be used for things like food cravings, for, for mm. cigarettes and stuff, for, you know, for anxiety. Yeah. And it can be used for all sorts of things. So, yeah, EFT is a, a, a fabulous thing to be able to, to learn. And it's really simple to do as well. So, 
there's that. And of course, I'm a, I'm a health and wellness coach. So I started with um, the IIN, the Institute for Integrative Nutrition in America. And I'm not a nutritionist, but I've studied nutritional theories. And there are a lot of them, <laughs> a lot of different things. But, you know, there again, it comes under that, that umbrella of coaching. And my particular interest is in gut health mm. because the gut and the brain are, well, all your organs are inextricably linked, but the, the gut and the brain are linked via the vagus nerve. So what's going on in, up here affects the tummy. It affects the gut, the gut microbiome. And whatever's going on in the gut microbiome will affect up here as well. So we have that link. So I'm very passionate about about gut health as well as mental health and all sorts of you know that, that under, the, under that umbrella if you like so when people come for whatever the presenting issue is that they think oh I'll, I'll get sue to sort me out on that um maybe there is a pandora's box that needs to be opened up if they want to if they're ready they have control yeah. over it but you've got this whole toolbox of of skills yeah. to find what's right for each person because everyone's so different aren't they at the end it's, of the day it's a, it's a multifaceted approach and it's you know one of those things that it, you've got i've got so many things tools that i can work with it just depends on what somebody comes to me for but it's a holistic approach it's you know that's what you're really looking looking at is is a holistic approach and everybody every person is different you know there are even if somebody comes to me for the same problem or the same issue you wouldn't necessarily treat them in the same way it's mm. bespoke so every single person is treated as an individual you know you, you like your your fingerprint is unique to you your gut microbiome is unique to you you are a very unique person there is nobody else like you so you, your experience whether it's from you know through divorce or whatever you know is going to be different mm. even the people that are getting divorced you know it that their, their perspective on things is different so you wouldn't treat them, them them two people the same you would treat them in different ways and going back to divorce just you're joining the uh, amicable divorce network uk you're going to be one of the founding members which is very exciting yeah. Yeah. um why why do you think that's important that there is this uh, you t completely unique network that's uh, uh, started in America is now in the UK where uh, the basic rule is you don't need to go to court there are better ways and then yeah. and, and and everyone on there obviously I'm ambassador for that group and we do have lawyers there but they're what I call the right kind of lawyers mediators collaborative lawyers arbitrators um why is it that you're keen to be part of that elite group well i, I think why would you not want to be i you know for me going to court is a very stressful situation for anybody and it costs such a lot of money the people that win are the lawyers you know and it puts such massive pressure financially you know mentally emotionally on on the people that are going through through the divorce so if you know being a part of the uh, amicable divorce network is i think probably one of the best things and people need to know that it's there you know people need to know about this because i think when you're going through divorce if all of a sudden this has come out of the blue then you don't you don't know that that's there because you've not been looking for it so you know, I think this needs to be marketed and put out there so that people do know there is another way. It doesn't have to be through the courts, costing a fortune. And just, just to round off, uh, the people who are in that situation, divorcing, whether it's early, early stages is best because we can put the, keep them on the right track more easily. Um, but any stage, uh, they should come and talk to us right through to this dealing with the co-parenting they will have their own stresses and and challenges in their lives just to round off could you remind people in those situations what kind of things they might want to think about and go ah oh, i can talk to sue about that well i think 
things like stress and anxiety um, and just coping mechanisms, coping mechanisms, you know, and, and moving forward with clarity and, and knowing that there's somebody there to actually help through that emotional um, that, that emotional and mental side of things, you know, because we often feel quite isolated in, even though you may have friends or family or whatever, you know, they all have their own agenda, if you like, whereas having somebody outside of that helping you through it who is really impartial and has no emotional ties to that, then that's going to help um, and help that person move forward with their life. And like that gentleman you spoke about who spent three years looking after everyone else after the death of his mm-hmm. daughter, I think there is a, particularly with mothers, is they'll always put themselves last and they're just trying to manage the whole thing and hold everything together, which can have, you know, as I discovered to my cost, uh, you know, quite massive implications on your health if you mm-hmm. allow that to to continue. So um, just to, uh, is there anything else you'd like to say to people on, on that front? Because I, I think it all taps into this whole self-love yeah. thing because you've been through basically a trauma you, yeah. you don't love yourself at that point. You think nobody loves you. You're desperately trying to cope. You're frightened about everything. Um, it's a kind of a recipe for disaster, really. And I think that's, that's for me, that's why I, I often will say to somebody, you know what, who's the most important person in your life? And they will go, the first thing most of them do if their parents say, oh, the children. Or it could be, oh, my mum or my dad or whoever, my partner or whatever. And I, and I go, wrong and they go what do you mean wrong my children are the most important people in my life you know and I'm like "Mm, no and and I and I look and and I just have to look and then they go me (laughs) yes you are the most important person in your life because you know without you what's it's it's almost like this you you as a mother, we do, and I've done it myself in the past, where we put everybody else, and we are at the bottom of this metaphorical pile. We come last. But you know what? It's just, it's no good. That's why they say, you know what? If you don't look after yourself, you're no good to anybody else. Mm-hmm. That's why they always say on an aeroplane, put your own mask on before you put anybody else's on. You know, you have to think of your own uh, your own well-being first it's not selfish it's self-care and I think that that's what people have to really start thinking about and changing their mindset is actually putting themselves first and that's hard to do it's, I'm saying from a mother's point of view because I am a mother but even a, a father as well it's it can often be very difficult to do because mm. you because you love that child or whoever it is and you want to put them first but really you know what you can't serve from an empty cup it all starts with yeah. you so. so you you help you help them fill up their cup yes. <laughs> over brimming I, I do i help them fill up their cup and um and you know uh, it's the, i think it's the best the best job in the world thank you so much for being on the show sue thank you thank you for inviting me i've had a lovely time Thank you.